I'm Graham Hancock. Uh, I'm 59 years old uh, as uh, we speak. Uh, I'm an author. Uh, I've written more than a dozen books, mainly looking at uh, historical mysteries, uh, but also most recently at uh, shamanism. Uh, and uh, I'm giving an interview on this subject because uh, I, I believe that drugs and drug policy are one of the great unaddressed issues in our society uh, and it needs a fresh look. Obviously it's, uh, it's, it's a, a matter of concern when we, when we live in a society that uh, punishes people for drug use, uh, sometimes very savagely. Uh, it's an uh, extremely difficult subject to be open on. Um, I think it's important to be open on it, otherwise we can never have a, a clear and honest discussion about this subject. Looking at the, at the broad expanse of, of history, what I, what I see in, um, in, in the Western civilizations, which, which I'm part of, uh, has been a gradual trend over hundreds, thousands of years, towards increased individual freedom. Uh, towards removing the unreasonable power uh, of the state to intervene in our lives. This seems to have been the direction of Western civilization, except in one area where we've actually gone back rather than forwards in the last 40 years, and that is the area of personal individual use of drugs. Uh, it seems to me that um, if uh, we are not sovereign, over our own consciousness, then we can't meaningfully claim to be sovereign over anything. It's useless, a complete waste of time to indulge ourselves in all sorts of self-congratulation about how free we are, about how our democracies are a model of freedom, when we're prepared to send people to prison for exploring that most intimate, that most precious, that most sapient part of themselves, which is their own consciousness. I feel that the war on drugs, the persecution of individuals for exploring their own consciousness with drugs, has set in motion a huge reverse in the true direction of Western history, pushed us away from the quest for individual freedom and pushed us uh, into, a pl into a place where we are empowering the state to control the most personal aspect uh, of our lives. And I don't think that can be good. I feel that it's a, a negative historical trend. Uh, and I feel that we need to wake up and do something about this because the struggle for freedom, for, for, for individual freedom, is perhaps the most important thing that Western culture has given to the world. We can't just let that go now. Uh, because of some sort of ideological hatred of drugs. First of all, let me, uh, let me be clear that when I, I talk about the right to use drugs, I am referring to adults. I am not referring to children. Uh, for example, I'm quite persuaded by the research which indicates that marijuana use, particularly heavy marijuana use, amongst teenagers can have extremely uh, detrimental effects uh, on those teenagers. Uh, I think the evidence for that is, uh, is, is quite compelling and I would not be urging or encouraging uh, teenagers to smoke marijuana. Uh, unfortunately, in the society we live, on, live in at the moment, uh, where nobody believes any of the information that's given about drugs, certainly amongst teenagers, they do not believe the information. It's seen to be tainted. It's seen to be coming from a source that they do not trust and, 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 and do not believe in. I'm not surprised that despite the dangers to their health, huge numbers of teenagers are continuing to smoke marijuana. Uh, I would like to see a, an honest uh, and, and open uh, debate on the subject with full information being available to all members of the public. One of the reasons why I'm convinced that full, honest information is the way to go uh, is what's happened with uh, tobacco uh, in our societies uh, over the last 20 years. Um, in 
precisely the period that we've seen a, a dramatic escalation in the use of almost all illegal drugs. We've seen a dramatic decline uh, in the use of the highly addictive, Ill, uh, highly addictive legal drug uh, called tobacco. And that decline in tobacco use has not come because people have been sent to prison for using tobacco. It's not come because their homes have been broken into by agents of the state for using tobacco. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not come because there are draconian laws that prevent the use of tobacco. The decline in tobacco use has come solely for one reason, because people have believed the good information that has been put out there that has shown them that tobacco use can be very bad for their health. And they've made choices not to use tobacco. Uh, I believe the same kind of level of information should be made available on drugs. As long as, as, long as those who take drugs are set in opposition against the state, feel themselves in danger of attack and harassment by the state, see the state effectively as their enemy, they are not going to believe what the state has to tell them. Um, if it is true that certain drugs are genuinely very harmful to our health, as we know is the case with tobacco, then it seems obvious to me that we need to remove this whole subject from the issue of criminal sanctions and we have to throw it out open to com public common sense. We have to give people information they can trust and they will act on that information. I believe for, for adults, if they choose not to act on that information, that's also their business. But the most important thing is that the information should be there, it should be trusted, and it should be honest. And we've definitely seen the evidence that where one harmful drug is concerned, where good information is provided, tobacco, it does result in a, in a reduction um, of, uh, of use. So with that proviso that, that we are talking about the use of drugs by adults, uh, I, I am in favour of restricting the use of drugs to children. Um, but I believe that that restriction will operate most effectively if children actually believe the information that is being given to them about drugs, which, uh, which is not the case at the moment. I believe that, that we're moving in a strange direction in, in our society today, which tends, which is in a rather sinister manner, is minimizing adult responsibility. More and more we find that the state is stepping in and, and presenting itself as taking responsibility for decisions that we as adults should really be making for ourselves. Uh, and one of those decisions is the decision as an adult, as a responsible adult, whether to use drugs or not. Now I would guess, I don't have the, the surveys or the studies to, to prove this, but I would guess that even in a regime where all drugs were completely legal, I would suspect that the vast majority of adults probably would not partake of them. Uh, I think that would be their choice uh, and, and I respect that choice. I think we are talking about a minority interest here. However, the, the such statistics as are available do show that it's a substantial minority interest, certainly of the order of millions of people uh, in, in Britain and, and, and tens of millions of people uh, in, in the United States, um, who are, as adults, interested in exploring their own consciousness with, uh, with, with drugs. Now, the way that the drug issue has been cast in our society up to now it's been cast, particularly by the media and by politicians, as a totally frivolous, uh, worthless, lightweight recreational pursuit. I personally don't view uh, the subject that way. If we use words like freedom, we have to, we have to use them in their, in, in, in their full meaning. Um, and where, where adults are concerned, um, if we want to imagine that we are free, uh, we, we have to imagine a society in which we are free to use drugs, even if those drugs may be harmful to us. That has to be our choice. After all, our society already accepts the principle 
that, uh, that individuals may do things that are harmful to themselves. Um, well, it's clear from the fact that we, that we tolerate and, and keep uh, completely legal uh, the use of alcohol and tobacco, both of which are, 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 are known major, major health risks, far more so than most uh, illegal drugs. But it's not only that. Um, we uh, put young men into the army. When they join the army, they're taking a job that may put their lives at risk. Uh, people go skiing. People go bungee jumping. People jump out of airplanes for the excitement of so doing. Let's not pretend, pretend that that's completely free of danger. There is risk in that adventure that the person has. And I would say, I've never done it myself, but when somebody jumps out of an airplane, I would imagine it has an extraordinary effect on their consciousness. It, 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 it must be a, a tremendous feeling. Why else would, would so many people do it? They must get something special out of it. And they've decided as adults that getting that special thing is worth the risk of jumping out of that plane. I'm not going to go to them and say, look, I know that this is a really special experience for you, but it's a bit dangerous, so I'm sorry, you're not allowed to do it. And actually, if I catch you doing it, I'm going to send you to prison. Now, I know that, that some drugs uh, are much more dangerous and risky than others. I know for example, that tobacco and alcohol are extremely dangerous and risky drugs. Um, personally, uh, I do not use and have never used uh, heroin or cocaine. I have uh, no idea what the cocaine experience is like. Other people have told me about it, and what they've told me makes me feel this isn't for me. This is, this, is, this is not my drug. From what I, I, I don't mean to put down people who use cocaine. That's, that's their business. But, 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 but for me, it sounds like uh, a short, noisy, busy, meaningless exchange. I, I don't see any depth in it. Uh, and and I, don't, I actually don't feel. That's also part of my freedom as an adult, is the freedom not to consume certain drugs. And what I've heard from people I trust about cocaine tells me that that is not for me. You know, um, I haven't broken my finger either, but when somebody who has broken their finger tells me that it hurts, I believe them. I don't need to break my finger in order to learn that experience, and, and, and that's why I'm not at all uh, attracted to cocaine. I'm not attracted to, uh, to heroin either, um, or, or any powerfully uh, addictive drug. Um, because I feel that, uh, that if I become absolutely habituated and addicted uh, with a substance, then again I'm actually losing control of my personal sovereignty. I have worked with the uh, visionary uh, shamanic uh, plants, for example ayahuasca, uh, which is actually a mixture of two different plants that are found in the Amazon jungle. Uh, there's archaeological evidence of the use of ayahuasca, which means the vine of souls, uh, going back more than 3,000 years uh, in the Amazon. Uh, it's uh, a powerful, visionary, halluc hallucinogenic uh, brew in which the active ingredient is DMT, dimethyltryptamine, which in the United States is a Schedule I illegal drug and in Britain is a Class A uh, illegal drug, possession of which can send you to prison for a very long time. Fortunately, throughout South America, in all the countries surrounding the Amazon basin, and increasingly in other countries throughout the world, the uh, use of ayahuasca for religious purposes uh, is being recognized. And in fact, the use of ayahuasca in all the countries bordering the Amazon basin uh, is not illegal. It's totally legal, and its use is actually protected uh, under laws of religious freedom. Uh, I applaud this. As, uh, as, as, as the way forward uh, on, on, on this particular debate. And I have found uh, ayahuasca, which I have drunk um, more than th 30 times uh, over the last several years, uh, I have found it to be uh, an enormously helpful influence in my life. And I would not like to think of a situation where I could never have approached ayahuasca or learned the lessons that ayahuasca has taught me. I believe that my life would be narrower, uh, meaner, and, and, and less full of meaning if I had not had those uh, experiences. 
An ayahuasca journey is a complex and difficult process. First off, there's the physical effects. Uh, ayahuasca is a beverage, it's a, it's, 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 it's a brew, and it's t it tastes uh, it's absolutely disgusting. It is, it is hard to imagine a more horrific and unpleasant taste. Um, and you have to brace yourself physically and mentally uh, before pouring this beverage uh, down your throat. Uh, I, I certainly do. It's very, very, very hard work. Um, secondly, within about half an hour to an hour of drinking the brew, most of us start to feel pretty ill. Uh, you're vomiting, you have diarrhea. Um, it's a most physically a most uncomfortable ordeal that you have to go through before um, the powerful visionary effects that be begin to take place. And uh, those visionary effects typically have two, two levels. One of them concerns what you might call personal development. Um, you know, in the Amazon, they believe that, that there is an intelligent spirit that lies behind ayahuasca. They don't think they're dealing with just plants. And who are we to say they're wrong? The, the shamans believe that, that an intelligent entity, a, a spirit being, lies behind the ayahuasca beverage. And that and that she, and they always regard her as a, as a female presence, um, that her business is the planet and the betterment of human beings. Strange idea, huh? That, but this is, this is what they, 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 they believe in the Amazon, and they know a damn sight more about it than, uh, than, than, than we do. Well, one of the ways this works is that ayahuasca will typically show you your own life uh, in an extremely clear and unconfused way. You know, normally we protect our own behavior with all sorts of little personal explanations and reasons for why we behave in the way that we do. Ayahuasca will show you absolutely clearly and honestly really why you behaved in the way that you did. Sometimes you may have been mean or harsh to another person and pass that off as absolutely the right thing to do under the circumstances. Ayahuasca will show you it was the wrong thing to do. It will show you that uh, Anger and ego and arrogance and pride in your own personality are not serving you and are not helpful. And it will keep teaching you these lessons again and again and again, showing you starkly and honestly how you are until you start fixing your behavior and uh, improve the way that you function in the world and work hard to become a, a less toxic and more positive person. Ayahuasca has done this for me, and it's done it for countless other people who, who I know. It's a mystery, but there it is. It puts you through that psychological process where you actually start examining your own life and asking questions about the way you behave. The second thing that Ayahuasca does um, is take you on a, 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 on a journey into parallel realms. Uh, now, of course, many scientists would say this is just uh, brain candy. This is just... Uh, just an illusion of your own brain, disturbed brain chemistry. Um, I don't agree with those, with those scientists. I can't prove they're wrong, but when I look at the burden of evidence, and particularly of the huge body of knowledge that shamanistic cultures have brought together uh, on the use of, of, of visionary plants, I'm, I'm inclined to believe that they're right, and that the reality is much more complicated that, than we imagine, and that we are surrounded uh, all the time by a vast, invisible reality, normally invisible to our senses. And, and what I've found, and many others report this with, with, uh, with, uh, with ayahuasca, uh, is that it seems to retune the receiver wavelength of the brain and allow those normal, invisible realms to become visible for a brief period. So it connects us to, uh, to a much wider reality. Um, this can be deeply disturbing, but also, but also incredibly nourishing to realize that, uh, that we are not just this finite little dot, that we're part of a much huger and, and, and wider and awe-inspiring uh, reality. And the third thing that, that happens with ayahuasca, and it's very curious, is that, that if you have some aspect of your life that's creative, could be writing poetry, could be painting, Ayahuasca again and again will enhance that. 
all over the world now, we're seeing incredible visionary art uh, produced by people um, who've been inspired by ayahuasca. Now, this is not news to the shamans in the Amazon because they create incredible visionary art and have done for thousands of years um, documenting their ayahuasca journeys. But it's happening in the West now. I'm thinking of people like uh, Alex Gray, uh, Bob Venosa, uh, Martina Hoffman, um, who have, have, have brought into being incredible works of art uh, inspired by their ayahuasca uh, experiences, it seems to uh, enhance uh, certain aspects of, of human creativity. All of these things are available to us should we choose to drink ayahuasca. We do not have to drink ayahuasca. It's a personal choice. I would like to live in a society where that personal choice can be made free of fear uh, free of ideology, free of propaganda, simply a decision that an adult makes about his or her own life. I'm not claiming that I'm, that I'm a better person because of ayahuasca, but what I am saying is I'm, I'm trying to be a better person because of ayahuasca. It, it's, it's showed me serious faults in my personality. I regard them as serious, which, which need to be fixed. And... Life is a journey and I'm 59 years old and I only have, you know, so much longer on this planet. And with the time I have left, I would like to do it right rather than do it wrong. And I'm grateful to Ayahuasca for showing me where I've been doing things wrong. It's very hard to change deeply ingrained old habits, but I am trying and I shall continue to try while I'm on this planet. In terms of my creativity, uh, ayahuasca has really been, has really done something quite extraordinary for me. Um, for uh, my whole working life, uh, I have been uh, a non-fiction writer. Uh, my background is in journalism, in mainstream journalism. My last journalistic job was as the uh, East Africa correspondent for The Economist based in Nairobi in, 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 in Kenya back in the early 80s. I was very much involved in, in current affairs, um, uh, in facts, in information. And this continued even as I moved out of journalism and into writing books. I became, I became deeply interested in historical mysteries, particularly could, could there have been um, a lost civilization? Could there have been uh, a forgotten episode in, in, in human history, a, a lost civilization by any other name? Th this, was, um, th this was a mystery that, that, that intrigued me. And really from, from the late 1980s um, through until um, the early uh, two, 2000s, um, I, was, I was focused uh, totally on very detailed explorations of historical mysteries um, and in um, everything that's involved in writing a thorough non-fiction book including a thousand footnotes and, and uh, really documenting and explaining my sources in, in, in every case, bulletproofing every argument uh, against critics. And this was, this was normal to me. This is the, the way that I, I had been used to working for very, 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 very many years. After encountering ayahuasca, something else happened. I began, to, I began to feel an urge to express myself in a different way. Um, not just to write non-fiction. I suddenly found I wanted to write a novel. I wanted to, I wanted to create something out of whole cloth. Um, and initially I wasn't, I wasn't sure what. And, and here's the strange thing, on a, on a series of, um, once I'd established that intent, that, that, that I wanted to try to write fiction rather than, rather than non-fiction all the time, on a series of ayahuasca journeys in uh, Brazil uh, in 2006, uh, I was given, I can't put it any other way, I was given a story. The, the story came to me in the, in, in, in the visions. I saw clearly two characters, one 24,000 years ago, one today, connected in 
a battle of good against evil that unfolds through, through time. I don't know where this idea came from. It, 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 it literally came to me in a vision um, uh, under the influence of, of ayahuasca. And it wasn't just one, it was a series, it was a series of, 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 of visions. And at the end of it, I felt like I'd, I'd almost downloaded uh, an, an, an entire story. And I came back to, I came back to England um, motivated to write, to write that story. Um, like so many things with, with, with ayahuasca, the, the inspiration is only part of what happens. Then you need to do the hard work. And I've been doing the hard work for the last, uh, the last three years. But uh, now I have, I have written that novel. I don't believe I ever would have written it uh, if it hadn't been for my encounter with the visionary vine uh, of the Amazon, the vine of souls. It's a controversial view, but I am in favour uh, of the legalisation, uh, not the, just the decriminalisation, but the legalisation uh, of all drugs uh, for personal use. Uh, and I'm in favour of this uh, for lots of reasons. First of all, philosophically, um, I believe adults must be free to make decisions about their own consciousness, even if those decisions are harmful to them. I, I, I think that's, for me, that's a fundamental philosophical issue about the kind of society that I want to live in. But secondly, uh, it's clear after more than 40 years of the so-called war on drugs, after the expenditure of billions and billions of pounds and dollars and other currencies all around the world to suppress and persecute drug users, it's clear that it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. It's not just that it works badly, it actually doesn't work. It, in terms of its stated objectives, the war on drugs has achieved nothing. Uh, it seems to have made the problem worse. Um, we uh, are, are creating a situation, willfully it seems, where, where, whereby the most horrendous people on the planet, cr criminal gangs, are being entrusted with the consciousness of our children. What a huge mistake. What a, what a gift we are giving to criminality by making drugs illegal. It's, ti it's time to recognize that there is a fundamental human urge to alter consciousness. It is basic to being human. It's not there for everybody, but it's there for some people. It might be a, it might be a minority urge, but it's, but it's there. Um, we have to create a society where that minority who wish to alter their own consciousness in a responsible manner using quote-unquote drugs have the right to do so. The kind of society that we've got now where we've created huge armed bureaucracies to break into people's homes, to punish them, to send them to prison, to shame and humiliate them, and all the apparatus of the state that that involves, the empowerment of the state that that creates, the very notion that the state has a right to decide what we as adults may and may not experience uh, in, in our own consciousness is so negative uh, and so wrong uh, that it has to be opposed. So the war on drugs, it hasn't worked. It's empowered criminals. It's empowered state bureaucracies. We need a new way forward. And that only way forward is, is going to require great courage uh, on the part of politicians. We have to remove this, uh, this, this legal structure uh, and, and make drugs legal, put the criminal gangs out of business, by all means tax drugs. I'm totally, I'm totally in favour of that, but at the end of the day we have to leave adults free to make decisions about their own lives. The government position on this is so, is so mistaken because, because despite the war on drugs and the, and the violent penalties that are imposed, drugs are everywhere available in our societies. Our governments are not protecting anybody against using drugs by making drugs illegal. Uh, if they were, then drugs would not be available. But drugs are available everywhere in our society. This is a reality. We just have to accept that fact. Okay, so what we have to do is, is create a legislative framework where, where we recognise that drugs are available and that people can get access to them uh, and, and actually seek to minimise the harms as effectively as we can with honest and open information.